the Dell Operator and Field Operations. In this video, we're going to talk about scalar and vector fields, this mysterious thing called the Dell Operator, which is really just a three-dimensional derivative, although it can be generalized to more dimensions. But given that, we can start talking about using the Dell operator to calculate things like the gradient of a scalar field, divergence of a vector field, curl of a vector field, and Laplacian of both scalar and vector fields. So let's dive right into this. Scalar versus vector fields. We start our discussion with a scalar field. A field is just a function. And in the context of electromagnetics, we're talking about something that is a function of position and X, Y, Z for Cartesian coordinates. And a scalar field simply has a single number associated with every position. So if we plot a scalar function, it looks something like a cloud. A cloud has a certain density or thickness and that changes with position. In contrast, we can talk about vector fields. Vector fields are also a field, a function of position for us, X, Y, and Z. But now there's two pieces of information associated with each point. One piece of information is still that magnitude. So there's a scalar field hidden inside the vector field. And in fact, it is the magnitude of the vector field. That second piece of information is the direction. And we would draw a vector field different ways but here's the most common way where it's a bunch of arrows the length of the arrow is conveying the magnitude information and the direction of the arrow obviously is conveying the direction of that field so each point contains two pieces of information magnitude and direction now we can look at the same things in three dimensions and I think the analogy of a cloud is maybe even better for the third dimension. And here we're looking at these little blobby, transparent cloud looking things. It's just a single number associated with each position. And when we visualize it, we get clouds. We start to get a lot of information here, but we can visualize a three dimensional vector field. The magnitude is still cloud like, but now we have all these little arrows telling us the direction of each point. And it starts to be a lot of information and very difficult to visualize. And here we're looking at all that information and we can already see, wow, that's kind of confusing. All those little arrows just start to look like noise. So the jury's still a bit out on how to really visualize a three-dimensional vector field. And you know we can visualize it with all the information this way, but then imagine we're also trying to plot other things and it just gets very confusing. So if you come up with a very clever way to visualize a vector field, uh, let me know. One way people do this with, is with field lines. In fact, fields don't have lines. That's a mathematical abstraction where we're just kind of tracing the direction of the arrows and forming lines. So that is one way we can track a vector field. And then the density of those lines can also convey the magnitude of the vector field. Involved in this is the concept of isocontour lines. So here we're just looking at a two dimensional scalar function. So it's just a single number associated with each point. And if we were to think of this as elevation, maybe where these bright areas are high elevation and the white areas are low elevation, these lines, these isocontour lines are the lines of equal elevation. So if you were to walk along one of these lines, you would not be going up or down. So it's kind of like an easy path if you were hiking. And of course, now if you're going against the lines, you're going straight up or downhill. So those are the isocontour lines. And sometimes we visualize scalar functions just from the isocontour lines. The Dell operator. The Dell operator is simply a three-dimensional derivative. It's probably easiest for us to think about this in Cartesian coordinates. So we have our Dell operator and it is equal to, we have a derivative operation happening with respect to X. And so we take the derivative of whatever our function is and that derivative we put in the X direction. We then calculate the derivative in the Y direction 
and we put that function in the y direction. We then calculate a derivative with respect to z and put that function in the z direction. And that's our del operator. And we can write this in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. The, while the calculations are involving different symbols for cylindrical spherical, it's the same concept. And if we were to plot it, we really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And the fact the cylindrical and spherical del operator, they're derived from the Cartesian del operator, just using coordinate transformation. The last thing I'll mention here is, notice this is a vector. The del operator is a vector. It has an X and a Y and a Z direction. So one might ask, why don't we draw it with an arrow over top? And you know what? I don't know. It's just convention to write it only as the del operator. And I rarely ever see it with an arrow over top. In fact, the only time I ever do that is just when I'm trying to explain the point that we never draw it with an arrow over top, but uh, maybe it should be because it is a vector quantity. Here is a chart that I like to draw that I think is particularly useful when you're learning this. And in the first column is the operation that we're talking about, a whole bunch of stuff here. And in the second column is what we're giving the operation. So for example, if we're adding two things, if we're giving it vectors, then in the third column is the output, we would get a vector from that. So we, we give it vectors and it calculates a vector. So that's addition and subtraction. If we're looking at a dot product, we give that vectors and the dot product gives us a scalar quantity back. If we're looking at a cross product, we give that vectors and we get a vector from that. If we're looking at a gradient, we give that a scalar function and we get a vector function. Divergence, del dot u, we give it a vector function, u, and we get back a scalar function. That's really because it's a dot product. It has nothing really to do with the del operator there. Curl, again, this has really nothing to do with this being a del operator, the fact that we have a cross product. Curl, we give it a vector function and we get a vector function. Laplacian, we have two different flavors of this. We have a scalar Laplacian that we give a scalar and get a scalar. And we have the vector Laplacian that we give a vector function and we get a vector function. So I find this a, a very useful plot. And if you can somehow commit this to memory, you can look at vector equations and just mentally figure out whether you're calculating a scalar or a vector. And that can be quite useful when you're manipulating and trying to simplify equations. Gradient of a scalar field. So we start off with a scalar field. Remember, a scalar field is a function. So it's a single number associated with each point. Here we're showing a two-dimensional function. And so it looks kind of like a cloud. When we calculate the gradient, we're getting a vector function. So we're calculating two pieces of information. The direction part of the gradient is pointing uphill towards increasing values. And the magnitude is the slope. So if this were an elevation map, so the red would be the peaks of some kind of mountain and the white being the valleys, these arrows are pointing uphill and the length of the arrow is telling us how steep the path is. Now, the gradient is not a very intelligent calculation. For example, if we're standing over here, we know that the peak is over here, but notice the arrows are not pointing this way. It's very much like, back to the elevation analogy, like you're standing and just staring down right at your feet and you're not looking at the landscape around you. And all you know is the slope right at your feet. And you can tell which way is immediately uphill and you can tell what the slope is. And so each arrow here is kind of like that. It's like you're standing there just staring at your feet and plotting the direction and magnitude of the slope. It doesn't know sort of globally to go in this direction to get to the top. It's a local calculation, if you will. So that's the gradient. It points uphill and conveys how steep or how quickly the numbers are increasing in that direction. Now, if we were to plot the ISO contour lines that we talked about previously, these arrows are always perpendicular to the ISO contour lines. 
that makes a little bit of sense. Remember what those isocontour lines, if you were walking along those, you would not be changing elevation. Well, if the gradient is pointing along the steepest rate of change, it makes sense that it would not have any components in the directions of those isocontour lines. So we can express the gradient in Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. And as I mentioned before, really the cylindrical and spherical can be derived from the Cartesian through a coordinate transform. And I guess our brains are wired to think Cartesian. So that's normally the easiest to visualize. So we write the gradient of a scalar function as our del operator multiplying on the scalar function v. And so we take the partial derivative of a v with respect to x and whatever that answer is, we put in the x direction. We then take the partial derivative with respect to y, and whatever that answer is, we put in the y direction. And then last, we take the partial derivative of that scalar function with respect to z, and whatever that function is, we put in the z direction. That is the gradient. And I could talk to you through a similar thing for spherical or uh, cylindrical. The gradient comes with some algebra rules that's very important to understand if you're simplifying equations with vectors in them. We have the sum and difference rule. So we are calculating the gradient of the sum or difference of two vectors. And it turns out we can just expand that how we would expect from normal algebra rules, where it be the gradient of u plus or minus, the same plus or minus we originally had, the gradient of v. We have the product rule. Remember this del is really a derivative operation. And so the expression on the right will make some sense when you think of it that way. So the gradient of the product of two vectors is the first vector times the gradient of the second plus the second times the gradient of the first. And that's the same as the product rule for derivatives. And that's because this del operator is a derivative operation. Well, likewise, we have our quotient rule, the gradient of a scalar function divided by a scalar function. Well, it is the second scalar function times the gradient of the first minus the first times the gradient of the second, all divided by the second scalar function squared. Again, very similar to the quotient rule for derivatives. And that's because the del operator is a derivative. We have the power rule. If we're calculating the gradient of a scalar function raised to the n power, and that works kind of like a derivative, it's n times the scalar function to the n minus one times the gradient of that scalar function. Now just some, some notes or properties of the gradient. And to help us along, I've drawn two scalar functions at the bottom. So the gray is the scalar function and the blue arrows are showing the gradient of that scalar function. So the first thing is the gradient of a scalar function is a vector function. That's because it has to point in the direction of increasing value. So it must be a vector function. And the vector conveys two pieces of information, the direction of increasing values and how quickly those values are increasing, that second being the magnitude. So the magnitude of the gradient is sort of the local maximum rate of change in v. And this goes back to the analogy of you're standing on you know, uh, mountains and valleys and you're staring only at your feet. You're not looking at the surrounding landscape. So you only know what the slope is and which way's uphill right where your feet are. It is a local calculation. So local maximum rate of change in v. And what maximum rate of change means, it's pointing in the steepest direction. The gradient points in the maximum rate of change in v, kind of saying the same thing as 2. The gradient at any point is perpendic perpendicular to the constant v surface that passes through that point. So this is when we plotted those isocontour lines and we saw that the gradient was always perpendicular to that. And that made sense because those isocontours are tracing the lines where there is no change so it would make sense that the direction of maximum change would have to be perpendicular to that. And our last point, 
the gradient always points towards increasing numbers in that scalar function. Divergence of a vector field. So we're looking at a three-dimensional image over on the right. So it's a three-dimensional vector field at this point. And it's rotating so that we can better see what's going on with that vector field. But there seems to be two peculiar regions, or sort of here and sort of here. And it, it looks maybe porcupine-ish where everything seems to be emerging or converging to these certain regions. And that's divergence. Divergence is the tendency of the field to diverge or converge. Now, if we were to calculate the divergence, that's a dot product between our del operator and this vector function, we can plot that. So the arrows over here are the original vector function, and that's because divergence is a scalar, but the, the cloud here that we're plotting, that's the divergence. And so the blue corresponds to negative numbers and the red corresponds to positive numbers. Since we're calculating divergence, we get positive numbers when the field appears to be diverging. So it's pointing away from this region. Well, likewise, if the arrows are pointing inward toward a point, we will get negative divergence. Maybe we could call that convergence, but it's not called that. It's just called negative divergence. So divergence measures the tendency of a vector field to diverge from a point or converge to a point and it is a scalar answer. There's no direction to that. It's just how much the vector field seems to be diverging from a particular point. We can look at this in two dimensions and maybe this is a little bit more clear, uh, but here we have a point that we definitely seem to have this vector field diverging from. Likewise, over here, it seems to be converging to a point Here's a point of, of divergence and then another point of convergence. So if we calculate the divergence of that, that's what we see. Where the field is emerging from a point, we're diverging, we get positive numbers from our divergence calculation. And we get negative numbers where those arrows are converging. So the divergence, it is a dot product. It's del dot this vector function. And here we take the partial derivative with respect to x of the x component of that vector function. And we don't put that in a direction. We're getting a scalar quantity. And so we just add to it the partial derivative with respect to y of the y component of that vector function plus the partial derivative with respect to z of the z component of that vector function. So they're added together. We're not putting this first one in the a direction, y direction, z direction. We're not doing that. We're adding these partial derivatives and not putting anything in any direction. It is a scalar quantity. And we have some algebra rules for divergence. Let's say we're trying to calculate the divergence of the sum of two vectors. Well, we just multiply this out as if it was sort of standard algebra. So that's the divergence of A plus the divergence of B. Let's talk about three notes, observations, or properties of this divergence operation. The divergence of a vector function is a scalar function. Now, it wouldn't make sense to talk about the divergence of a scalar function. A scalar function has no direction associated with it. So the whole concept of convergence, divergence has to come from direction. So we can only have the divergence of a vector function. And the answer we get is a scalar function. The divergence itself has no direction. It's just a measure of how much the field looks as if it is diverging or converging. No direction associated with that. So the divergence of a scalar field does not make sense. I already mentioned this. That's because a scalar field has no directionality associated with it. And the last thing, the original vector field is always going to point from larger to smaller numbers of the scalar field that the divergence function calculates. Curl of a vector field. 
Here we're showing a three-dimensional vector field. And what you can see is that I've thickened the arrows in a cross section of it. So we can see those a little more plainly than all the other arrows. But the field, in fact, is actually uniform in this X direction. But what we can see is that right here, we see a counterclockwise circulating field. And in the lower right, we can observe that there's a clockwise rotating field. So there definitely seems to be some kind of circulation or curl. And in fact, here we have two different kinds, one that rotates clockwise and one that rotates counterclockwise. So now we calculate the curl and that's this del operator cross product with a vector function f. And on the right, we're showing that original 3D vector field. But now we've put blue arrows in here that are showing the result of curl. The curl, since it comes from a cross product, is another vector quantity. Remember, vectors are always conveying two pieces of information. And so uh, the curl itself is measuring the tendency of the vector field to circulate about an axis. That gives us hints about what these two pieces of information are. So the magnitude of the curl is conveying the strength of that circulation. And the vector part of the curl is conveying the axis of that circulation. And that's what we can see with these blue lines. Uh, notice when we had the, the clockwise, or I'm sorry, the counterclockwise circulation, the curl points this way. But down on the lower right, where we have the clockwise circulation, the curl is actually pointing the other way. And so there's actually a handedness associated with this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. So that's curl. Maybe it's a little clearer in two dimensions, or here we're looking at a cross section of a three dimensional thing, if you want to think of it that way. But we can clearly see that there is some kind of clockwise rotation happening here. It looks like maybe there's a bit of another clockwise rotation. Maybe here's a bit of a counterclockwise rotation. So we definitely notice this in the field. So if we calculate the curl, now the curl is really pointing in and out of the screen here. So I'm really just showing the magnitude as the, the blue and red highlights. But what we can see for the, the clockwise circulation is that we got a negative curl, implying that it's really pointing into the screen. And then we have the red when it's rotating counterclockwise, and that's pointing out of the screen. As I mentioned, there's a handedness associated with this. So the curl operation is a tedious one to calculate, and I'm not sure it's worthy of talking through the equation here. Uh, but it is calculating the tendency of this vector field A to be circulating. And we can calculate this in Cartesian, cylindrical, spherical, or really any coordinate system. So there are two algebra rules for curl that we'll talk about here. The first is, what is the curl of the sum of two vectors? Well, it's the curl of the first plus the curl of the second. And by the way, if this were a minus sitting here, uh, we would just have a minus here. So that's called the distributive rule. We also have a triple product, but with the, the curl operation here. So this is saying, what is the curl of the cross product of two vectors? Notice we can't have a dot product sitting here because the dot product would return a scalar quantity and the curl of a scalar does not make any sense. So we don't have a rule for A dot B, the curl of that. We only have a rule for the curl of A cross B. And this ends up being A times the divergence of B minus B times the divergence of A plus B dot del times A minus A dot del times B. Now think about what's in here. This del operator is an operation. It's not actually numbers sitting there. So in fact, when we say b dot del, uh, we're not calculating numbers here. What we're doing is we're really just scaling a derivative operation. So what's in parentheses here is a derivative operation that would happen on A that's being scaled by B. And likewise over here, this is a derivative operation happening to B, vector B, that's being scaled by vector A.
let's get into this handedness. And it's all summarized in this uh, picture to the right. So this green line, let's say that's the curl of some vector function A. And down here, I'm showing the vector function A that has a circulation. So this is a counterclockwise circulation. So if you take your right hand, this is actually my right hand, and I have curled my fingers in the direction of the circulation. And when I do that, my thumb points in the direction that the curl would point. And this is called the right hand roll because if you do this with your left hand, you're gonna get it backwards. So this has to happen with the right hand and if there's a handedness to curl. So uh, some properties to end with. The curl of a vector function is a vector function. That's because the vector part is showing us the axis of that circulation and the magnitude, the strength. It doesn't make sense to talk about the curl of a scalar field because we're talking about something that circulates, that requires some kind of directionality in order to calculate it, and a scalar field has no directionality. Curl follows the right-hand rule that I have shown to the right. The divergence of the curl of a vector field is always zero. And in fact, this is something we'll talk about a little bit later. It's kind of a neat property, but it's a general property. Divergence of curl is always zero, no matter what that vector function is. The curl of the gradient of a scalar field is always zero. And in fact, this will be very important when we talk about electrostatics. It is going to let us define a scalar function from our electric field, and I'm foreshadowing a bit. We wanna make a note, we can't reverse the order of operation here. So del dot A does not equal A dot del, or even just put a negative sign there, or whatever you might think happens. It's those, those don't even think this way. So del dot A, this is actually calculating a derivative of A. We'll get numbers from that. Whereas A dot del, we're not getting numbers from this, right? This del operator has no numbers. This is operations. So what we've done here by an a dot del, we're setting up an operation. We're setting up a derivative being scaled by a. So a derivative operation is very different than just numbers. So those two aren't even equivalent in concept at all. So don't, don't think that way. Laplacian operation. So we have two flavors of Laplacian. We have first our scalar Laplacian. So our scalar Laplacian is a sort of second order del operation and we get a scalar quantity back. And here's a bit more strict definition of a scalar Laplacian. It is the divergence of a gradient. And so we can write this in Cartesian coordinates as the second order derivative with respect to x of our scalar function, plus the second order derivative with respect to y of the scalar function, plus the second order derivative with respect to z of our scalar function. And these are just being added together. They're not assigned a, y, or sorry, x, y, z directions at all. So this is a completely scalar answer. And here I'm trying to visualize what we get from this uh, Laplacian. So we start off with our original function. That's this sort of grayish looking mesh and it's got peaks and valleys. Then from that, I calculate a Laplacian. And I'm showing that with this colored plane here. And notice it's giving us the, the strongest values where the function has its, its valleys and it's hidden under the peak, but also in the peak. And so notice the curvature here is the strongest. And we know from second order derivatives that second order derivatives measure, measure curvature. So the Laplacian is somehow measuring the curvature of our scalar function. We have a vector Laplacian. And so the vector Laplacian is defined as the gradient of the divergence minus the curl of the curl of A, <laughs> wow. And so we get, basically this is called the Laplacian of a vector function. It gives us another vector function. And maybe this definition down here is a little bit easier way to visualize it, but it is the scalar Laplacian of the X component of our vector put in the X direction, plus the 
scalar Laplacian of the y component of our vector function put in the y direction plus the scalar Laplacian of the z component of our vector function put in the z direction. So a vector Laplacian is a combination of three scalar Laplacians. Here is my attempt to visualize the vector Laplacian. So we're giving it a vector function a and we're calculating a vector function from it. So the blue vector function is the original vector function a and then the red is the Laplacian that we calculate from it. There's four points or observations or properties of the Laplacian that I want to point out here. The first is the Laplacian of a scalar function is a scalar function. This will arise when we get to electrostatics and it is what's going to let us, instead of trying to analyze problems in terms of the vector electric field, it will let us analyze things with a scalar function, the electric potential. And so the math gets easier. And that's one area where this Laplacian, the scalar Laplacian will arise. The Laplacian of a vector function is another vector function. This is going to arise when we're deriving the wave equation. Classification of vector fields. So we have what we call irrotational fields. So del cross some vector function, this is calculating curl. And if that equals zero, it's saying that the curl is zero. The field cannot appear to be circulating about any sort of axis. So it's not rotating, it is irrotational. So we have two examples here. Here we have what is really a diverging field that's clearly not rotating about any sort of axis, that would be irrotational. And then on the right here, we're looking at something that seems like it's circulating counterclockwise. This would clearly be a rotational field and not satisfy this. So we cannot call this one on the right an irrotational field. Some examples of irrotational fields, gravity and electric potential. Some consequences of being irrotational. So irritational fields essentially have to follow straight lines. Yeah, they sort of curve a little bit. Um, if you've ever seen, you know, the field between the plates of a capacitor, they essentially go from one plate to another, but near the edges, they sort of curl around. Um, but for the most part, we're obtaining solutions that are following straight lines and not forming loops or anything. Another consequence, if we have an irrotational field, then this integral has to be satisfied. If we do a line integral of a dot dl, we get zero if it's irrotational. And so we call that a conservative field. And we'll be doing lots of line integrals like this in this class. So on the previous slide, we talked about things that don't have rotation. Here we're talking about things that don't have divergence and we call these solenoidal fields. So del dot a, this is divergence equals zero. So here the field cannot appear to diverge. Fluid flows can't have divergence because that would require that we're sort of making fluids from nothing or somehow sucking them into a little tiny black hole, you know. So fluids are conserved. They just kind of flow and they don't converge or diverge. Uh, magnetic fields are also solenoidal. They don't diverge and that's because we don't have magnetic charge we have some consequences of this. If the vector function does not diverge from any points, it has to form loops. And so since we're saying this about magnetic fields, we can already conclude that magnetic fields always have to form loops until someday somebody comes up with a magnetic charge. And then of course that wouldn't be true. Another thing, if we have a solenoidal field, in other words, that the divergence is always zero, then if we do a surface integration of that vector function, we will always have to get zero and the field has no net flux coming out of a closed surface. If it's not a closed surface, we can't conclude this. It has to be a closed surface to conclude that. Laplacian vector fields. So we would call a vector field Laplacian if it is both irrotational and solenoidal. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video.
I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.